in 2014, when I decided to travel the world, like going to Morocco, Norway, Germany, France, Portugal, Spain, I've pretty much been a lot of places. When I started to travel, in particular Morocco, when I was there, 2014, is when they started to happen pretty much all the time. I don't really know what kicked it off, but one night I was waking up in sleep paralysis literally every single night. And every single night I'm in sleep paralysis thinking that I'm dying again. And not only in sleep paralysis, but popping, leaving my body, right? And they were happening so much in Morocco where I actually asked it to stop. I'm like, please stop this, getting sick and tired of going through this process because for people that have sleep paralysis and leave their body, the sensation is if you were to die, it would be no different. Like the sensations of death, like that, what it would mm. feel like, the exiting process. So every single night when you feel like you're dying, you're just like, okay, I've enough. They never fully shut down from that point. And they've been a natural reoccurring thing for me throughout my entire life. And it wasn't until I started to realize that in, in getting rid of the fear is when I started to access all things really remember a lot of things like the records accessing thoughts time as well and i wanted to find a way that i could start to control it because they were out of the blue for me i was like okay i really need to find a way to control this state all right so if i'm entering sleep paralysis naturally how do i actually control it and get there when i desire to do it and so through the years really i've developed my personal method that i use for myself which is to pretty much when I choose to leave my body every single night. And it's, yeah, that's how it started really. I wanted to ask you about the sleep paralysis because you reminded me, I used to get sleep paralysis a lot when I was a kid. I've never talked to anyone about this actually. And it was pretty regular, but I don't remember anything. It, it usually came after some sort of nightmarish dream usually, but there was this being completely frozen, but there wasn't really anything that would come after that. I remember it feeling rather terrifying. I don't know whether it was from because of the dream or the paralysis or perhaps both of them. And then I just have to lay there and then wait and then it would eventually would fade. Do you think for people who want to have a controlled out-of-body experience that their sleep paralysis is a pretty necessary part of that or is just that's just how things evolve for you? No, the sleep paralysis is the most important part. That's what people miss, right? So the, when you're in sleep paralysis, what I failed to miss in the beginning of it is that's the gateway to access the other side without going, having a near death. Now the out of body and near death are one and the same thing because an out of body is a controlled near death. They turn yep. exiting the body. Now we, when you're in sleep paralysis, there is a temporary window, right? So if someone like you, you've, as a kid, you're in sleep paralysis. Now what happens if you do nothing, even if you don't know what to do, then that eventually subsides and you wake back up. Mm. Right. So yeah. like that sensation of, oh, the body feeling like it's dying, it does subside and then you wake back up. Now in that brief window, if you do certain things right of pushing yourself out, you'll leave every single time. The sleep paralysis is one of the hardest parts to get to if you don't do it naturally. Right. Mm. But it's the hardest places to get when you want to control it and do it at will. But people that get there naturally. It's just getting rid of the fear, understanding where you're at. And every single time without missing it, if you do things correctly, you'll leave the body. Yeah. Oh, that's encouraging because I've spent a lot of time and I had one successful out-of-body experience. And it was almost like I just happened to catch the fact that I'd just woken up and I just happened to have the, because I'd been like, okay, when I go to sleep, remember when you go to sleep, the method that I used was the Russian fellow where you like stand in front of the bathroom mirror anyway that was what i was thinking about so when i woke up and i happened to have sleep paralysis at the time and i would just woken up and i thought about doing what i did and then it was like an instant it wasn't even a there wasn't any sort of transitory period it was like one moment i was i knew i was laying in the bed and the next thing i was standing in front of the mirror which is i, I can't believe that i actually managed to pull this off but i haven't been successful ever since and that was like two years ago so it's interesting that I think I haven't paid enough attention to the sleep paralysis aspect of things. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. I've had uh, friends of mine and also people that I'm speaking to and helping mm. do this as well. It, when you do it for the first time, it's like a, it's a shock. It's a rush. It's like when you leave the body and you're actually leaving your body and you turn around and you see yourself sleeping on the bed again and you look mm. at yourself and you're still physical. 
it's a big rush and typically it's fear, anxiety, or just, holy shit, I'm actually, I've done it. Those high end emotions that you feel, if it's when you just leave, if you have a lot of anxiety, excitement, just when you leave the body, you get sucked back in because it, it yeah. wakes the body back up. Mm. So it's like, you have to learn how to control those emotions when you're coming out, because when you create like a distance within the body, like when you're out and then you create distance and then you're out for, let's just say 30 seconds, yep. at that point you could do whatever you want. You won't get pulled back in because there still is a slight magnetic pull back to the body as you're just coming out. And if you yeah. mess things up, you just get sucked back in as well. So Yeah. Okay. Did you relate to Robert Murray's book, which was Journeys Out of the Body, where his initial experiences with OBEs where they were happening against his will? I've never read it. Oh, it's never. interesting. Yeah, it was the same. He spoke about his, it wasn't something that he wanted to have happen. And he got to the similar point to what you mentioned, where he was just saying, I just want it to stop, just stop doing this. He thought he was going mad. That's what it could feel like, right? So yeah. it's like when you're accessing the other side, the unseen becomes seen to you. That's pretty much everything. And there's a point in this that I've, I've tried, and it's like a pointless endeavor, but I've tried to prove myself wrong prove that I'm hallucinating, crazy, like all those things, like all those silly mm -hmm. things. And then you start seeing things happening in real time. You go over to your friend's house, you see them doing something in real time that you possibly couldn't know. You confirm it with them, they get freaked out. It's, it, you start accessing the true nature of reality, the true universe, where we are. Some things people, the reason why they want to convince themselves that what they're experiencing isn't true, even though it is because a lot of things goes against a lot of people's current belief systems. Hmm. Right. So what's your understanding of what the out-of-body experience, astral travel, for want of a better word, I know that's, they're not terms that you're particularly fond of, but what's your understanding of what the phenomena is with what you've learned so far? So the dream and the astral are one, and I'm just going to put them as one and the same thing. They're in the same category, really. Because typically, right, and this is typically, when you are dreaming, most of the time, you're accessing your dimensional space, your field. This is where you could get individuals when they're dreaming, they experience potential or can see potential time events. So this is where you get people when they're dreaming, they see if they have family members in their circle, right, and they're in their time event, they could see potential future time events or something that, so I've seen the future, and then they wake up either a day later or a week later, they're like, wow, that actually did take place. Because when you're dreaming, it's your field. So you're able to tap into your thoughts, potential time events within your field, and also your fears and pleasures, right? This is where you get the dreams where like you, you're running, but you can't move. Something's after you. Your fears are expressed there. So therefore you experience that and therefore your pleasures. The out of body state, the near death, right? OBE near death, one and the same thing. When you're doing that, you're not just accessing your field but you you have access to your field, individual fields, the realm, dimensional spaces, and access to all things, right? So it's like a, the dream space is just a limited version of accessing more things that's available to you when you leave the body 100% and become fully conscious and aware there. Okay. Does so, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. I think I'll keep diving into that because I want to get, uh, get some more clarity about it. So related to OBEs is Lucid dreams. So I became interested in lucid dreams around, I guess, six, nine months ago. And I've had more success there. And what I mean by that is being in a dream and then realizing, oh, I'm actually in a dream. I'm actually dreaming. And then solidifying what I'm experiencing. I usually do that just by looking at the ground or trying to actually look closely at my hands, but looking at the ground seemed to work better. And then in the process of looking at the ground while I'm dreaming, things often change. And then it just becomes like realer than real at that point. So I'd realized that, yes, I am actually, I was dreaming and now I'm not, but I'm still asleep on the bed. So how does that happen? What's your understanding of that process where you go from dreaming to suddenly being lucid and being very aware? Fully conscious. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I've done that myself. So when you're in a dream, let's just say, because you're not fully consciously there, that's why it's still fuzzy, right? Mm. But when you focus on something in a dream, which is accessing your field, you can become exactly what you said. You focus on one thing. I focused mm. when I was doing it, I was in the, the living room and I was focusing on a cup on the bench. And then that brought me right back in fully 100% mm. there because it's, I don't know 
the exact reason why that happens. It's just, I think, because you're focusing so much, you're bringing your conscious fully there instead of just wandering. Yeah, like a little piece of it. Yeah. 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 Like a little yeah. fragment here. This is why when people are dreaming, they can't remember the details of things. But if people were dreaming in their dream space and they were to just stop and realize that they're dreaming and focus on one thing, they'll be fully pulled in 100% mm. fully aware there. And at that point, if you know how to navigate that space, you could pop out of your dream field, your thought forms, et cetera, and actually have an out of body and access, like I said, things that are happening in real time within this realm etc. But typically people don't know that. And then they're just conscious within the dream. They don't know that they could access more than just that field, that space. Yeah. It's so weird. It's, I guess I've got a lot more to learn, obviously, which is, which is great. I can learn this from you. It's like the few times that it's occurred, I couldn't put my finger on why was it that I suddenly realized that I was dreaming? It was like, I had the intention of having a lucid dream when I went to sleep, but it, Maybe I just didn't do it often enough, but it didn't seem to matter too much. It was just like a few times I just had, it just I almost woke up to the fact that I was dreaming and then everything changed from there. But there didn't seem to be any sort of real rhyme or reason to it, whether I'd had enough sleep or got enough sleep or was really thinking about it. It just seems to happen a bit randomly. But is it, I guess, with practice, can you actually more reliably cause an OB or a lucid dream to occur? Yeah, you could do it every single night if you wanted to, but I don't necessarily recommend. Dreaming is easy. That doesn't really do much in terms of this frying out effect. But I've noticed when I come out of my body 100% fully conscious, fully aware, when I started to do that every single night, I it fried out my central nervous system. That's the best way to say it. It's mm -hmm. like my consciousness, my soul was fine, but my body was getting sluggish. You know what I mean? It's just like too much information to download into the computer. And I like to use this example. It's almost like the body's like a computer system, right? So let's say you, we have a, a computer, our body's a computer, so we all have access to the internet. But when if you're trying to download five terabytes worth of information into a computer that cannot hold that information, it bogs it down. You know what I mean? It's all yeah. that information all at once bogs down the processing of the computer. That's what it's like if you do it every single day and if you're not, if you're not very well practiced at it, it'll start to bog down your physical body, fry you out, feel tired all the time, even though you are asleep. Yeah, that makes sense. I like to think of the brain as like a reducing mechanism. So it can handle quite fine what you experience in our everyday physical reality. But then when you start to put data in there, that's from a more expansive reality, it would make sense. That's really pushing the hardware harder than it's supposed to be pushed <laughs> in a way. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask you about you said when you had your early experiences, so up to the point where you actually can you describe for us you mentioned Celeste. Is Celeste like a guide or how would you describe that entity? So when I first came in contact with Celeste, she was put it this way, she was a being that I've known for a very long time on the other side. And th this is why when you hear near death experience stories, there are beings that you know over there that you've known forever, but you don't remember them. Now, so she was one of those beings. She wasn't necessarily a guide. It's more of a friend. Like just, yeah, you could use the word guide. You could use the word also angel as well. It's the same thing, but it's just they're your friends. Like they're just helping mm -hmm. you when you need help, giving you information when you ask for it. But she's someone that has been a very turning point in my life in terms of showing me things. And it, once she showed me a lot of things when I was 16, I couldn't make sense of it, to be honest with you. It's like, I, I remember trying to share the story and it just would not, I could just tell you the feeling because I didn't have the details because I wasn't coming out of my body so frequently as I am now controlled to access the information and get more mm. clarity on it. But since then, now I have a lot of clarity on things that she's shown me and detailed of the information, like time, how time works, thoughts, the nature of reality, like all that stuff she was showing me, the beginning of all things, really, like the black space, the void. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was almost like way too much information at that one experience where I was just like, it just felt amazing back then when I was trying to explain it. One of my other guests, Peter Panagor, so when he had a near death experience when he was about the same age, about 16, I think it was 17, or maybe slightly older. Anyway, but he didn't have the language to describe what had occurred to him. And it wasn't until much later that. So as a result, he didn't tell anyone for 20 years. 
he thought people would make fun of him or that they thought he would be mad. And two, he didn't really have the language to describe what had occurred to him. Did Celeste help you formulate a language and a way of describing things? And did you keep it all to yourself? Or at what point did you just start to talk to people about your experiences? So my, my parents are, are always knew what I was experiencing, right? Because mm. share with them all the time. And they, it, they would see certain things taking place as well. But publicly, I haven't shared it. Just, I just started sharing it like two years ago, a little bit. And now it's like full, it's like now I'm at the point where I have so much clarity around things. And also with the recent experiences that I've had being told about the great work on the other side, that, that was also one of my dead relatives that told me that when I left my body, I was communicating with him and he's like the most, they call it the great work, which is waking people up to the other side. So ever since then, I've, I've made it part of my mission here to wake people up to the other side because when you wake up to that you wake up to everything else everything it's almost like when you wake up to the true nature of the etern eternal self of where you go back to you have no choice but to slowly wake up to everything else and so i've just been sharing my experiences the insights the clarity and things that i've gained from the out of body state because the out of body state like i said before is no different from a near death you access the same thing and when people have a near death what they I'm not bagging down on those experiences, but it reminds me of like when I was 16 years old, it's one experience, you get all this information and you're trying to communicate all that through one experience, but take that same person that has had a near death, have them have a near death over a hundred times in a single lifetime. And they're going to have a lot more clarity and things to share. You know what I mean? So it's through all this time that I've been doing it, that clarity of things has become so much more clear to me and, yeah. uh, and it's also it's i feel like it's a responsibility to share it and share it in the right way because if you don't share it in the right way then it's really not even going to be heard and at that point there's really no point in even sharing it you know when you say in the right way so uh, i guess i think what you mean is a bit like the way that ufo research etc how it began it was very much anyone involved with that was a pariah and that's still something that they're battling with now even though it's becoming a bit more legitimate, the research in that area. I think it's the same sort of thing with out-of-body states. It's sharing it at the right time. I could go into some of the, like really deep stuff, but that but probably go over people's heads. And it's just mm. it's not going to be heard properly. So I like to keep things based off questions and things like that of just easing people, just giving, getting them used to the concept. Because it's, if I tell people right off the bat, everybody has the ability to leave their body whenever it is that they want and access potential time events, see individual thoughts, like literally see the thoughts of another person. Because when you're out of your body, you have access to also your field and their field as well. And when you're out, you could see their thoughts, not as just like a reading the mind, but you are actually in it and you could touch it, taste it, feel it feel every single emotion and the expression of that person that was thinking that particular thought at that time. And so when you access all these things, it's like, it's, you want to share it in a right way where people could actually hear it or clarity, if that makes sense. Mm. So it doesn't just mm. go in one ear out the other or way over the head. And then you miss the whole point of it. Yeah. You do have to pick your moments. So I've found yeah. that too, just even just talking the one and only out of body experience I've had, I've, I told a few closer friends and then I think obviously my wife was like, yeah, like she's completely fine with that. But you can just see that for some people, their belief systems allows for that. And for others, it's just too far beyond what they currently, the framework that they live their life within. And it's, yeah, you, I agree with you. People really do need to know that this is available. The, the tricky part is knowing who to tell, <laughs> who to talk to. But I guess you, if you have information like what you're doing, you put information out there, then people come to it of their own accord. So yeah. Thing. And I just think now is the right time as well. Like you, you, you mm. look at the, the consciousness of individuals are ready to receive it. You know, now anyway, you, you look in the past, it, even when I look when I was 16, trying to share this stuff was, it, it just wouldn't work. The consciousness yeah. just wasn't there for it. one of the important parts though, is getting people to understand that it's not a. This is not just for one individual. A lot of people, when they hear stories like this, they think it's for one person or you have to be some dedicated, trained for this for your entire life. 
and all that stuff. And it's, it, you don't have to do that at all. It's, you need to understand certain things like sleep cycles, what sleep paralysis is and how to control that. And when people learn how to do that, everybody can access what I call the other side, you know, it, what, why they're physically here. And a lot of people, when they hear that, they, sometimes it's, yes, it sparks something within them to try it. But when they're presented with the opportunity, like I've had a friend where I was trying to, I was showing him like the out of body stuff, giving him tips and stuff like that. And he, I said, this is the stuff that you could experience. You'll experience this. You may see a being in the room. You know, if you see a being in the room, don't freak out. And so he's used my method of doing the out of body state and he goes into, he's in sleep paralysis. He's there. She has. So everything that you said, actually, I'm in sleep paralysis as I'm coming out, but I felt this being in the room. And, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not ready for this. And then he just snapped himself out of it. So even like that, it's almost like some people just aren't ready to see it just yet. And so th they prevent themselves due to anxiety, fear. It's, I don't feel like I'm ready for this yet because it is very, it's more real than this experience here. It's hyper real. So yeah. I like to say it's more dense, right? But yeah. that's just another way to. I've always found the idea of accessing like different realities really exciting. And I think that was also part of my problem. I didn't go for very long because I was so excited about the fact that I'd managed to do it. And so more the, it, pretty much the opposite of fear. I don't know why I just, I didn't feel like it was anything to be afraid of, but it sounds like a lot of people are, do you find that occurs much with the people that you work with, where they, it's, it's the fear that gets in the way for them or is it some other thing? It's fear all the time. It's, yeah. I would say 99% of the time it's fear. And if it's not fear, then it's when they actually leave the body, they get too excited and they're like, oh crap, I'm actually out. And then it's suck right back in. Yeah. Yeah. But it's typically fear of, you're looking at, you have to get rid of the fear of death. Like first and foremost, like you have to be in, in these experiences, as you would know, in sleep paralysis, it's could be incredibly scary for people to experience that. Now, in order to leave and not wake up the body, you need to get into a space where you say to yourself, I'm okay with dying, even though you're not going to die. You just have to be that calm all the time. Mm. Um, and that's a hard one for people to break because it's such a, pe people still, deep down inside, they, the, the fear arises because they think there's still this 1% doubt that the universe dictates consciousness instead of consciousness dictates the universe. And if you believe that the universe dictates consciousness and you believe that there is a potential end to you, there, mm. there is death and you don't continue living. Your consciousness not, does not continue when you leave the body. So it's, there's those things sometimes. And it's also, if you have a, I was just talking to someone the other day that has a child and he was about to come out of his body as well. And it's that him having a child in the background was coming up to the forefront of all right, I'm in sleep paralysis. I'm just about to pop out. But what if I do die? The fear of death pops in. It's like mm. child wakes you up, anxiety. So fear is the biggest part that stops you from not only accessing the other side, but leaving your body. So how do you help people through that fear? It's helping them, but it's giving them reassurance. Most importantly, it's mainly just me saying, this is what you will feel. This is what it will feel like. It's going to feel like you're dying, but you'll pass this stage and then you'll feel this and then you can leave and stuff like that. And it's almost like when they go through that experience and they're like, oh, wow, what Darius has said is actually, that's what I feel right now. Mm. And it's that reassurance is okay. Yeah. Everything's going to be all right because it's taken me a long time to get rid of it myself. And it's just like, when you have somebody, like if someone were to share what I'm sharing now, when it was happening to me every single night in 2014 in Morocco. I would be accessing so much more stuff like way back then and information and clarity on things, but I didn't have anybody explaining to me what sleep paralysis was, how that's the gateway to access the other side, getting rid of the fear, giving me that just reassurance, really, you know, everything's pretty, it's going to be just fine. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned your relative is Passover and the great work on the other side. Could you tell us a bit more about that? So my uncle died. Uncle Bobby's, he's passed away about five, well, I think six years now, actually five, five, six years. It's been a while. And there was a point in time where I was out of my body and I don't know why I couldn't access him for almost a year, two years trying to like access. Now, all of a sudden I'm out of my body 
and he presents himself to me. I've seen him two times. One was in, it was almost like a, it was just a big open space. Really. It's like, it's like we were in space. And then the other time was in the halls of Amente, but the space version, he was telling me, he actually showed me, right? This is where we'll get into that. There's no judgment on the other side, which I think it alludes back to the fear. A lot of people think that they're going to be judged on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it, I'm going to go in this direction, but we'll go full circle back to your question. But a lot of people think they're going to get judged on the other side because they feel someone's going to judge them for the things that they have done here. This is where you hear karma and all those things. None of that is real. It doesn't exist. You cannot have unconditional love with a judgment. And if you really ask yourself that question, how could you have unconditional love with a judgment? You'll find that you cannot because it's one of the unbreakable laws of the universe that never change regardless of opinions and perceptions. And when you leave, you are the only one that is the judger of yourself. They say the unforgivable sin is the one that you can't forgive yourself for. And that's what it's like on the other side. And so going full circle, back to your question, my uncle was showing me certain things that I've withheld here, like love. And it was just small, minor things, but it's like when you're there, you have so much access to all things. It's almost like when he was showing me certain things, he wasn't showing me in like a judgment sense. He was just like, there's, look what you're doing here. And it's like that realization of my withholding of love, withholding of just my pure, authentic self, like my energy, just withholding that, brought me to my knees there in pain. And this is also, you do have the broad of different emotions on the other side too. You do have pain, you do have frustrations. That's why we've come here to begin with. A lot of people have come into this realm due to frustrations from the other side. And he was telling me, Darius, I was actually asking him too, I was like, what's the point? He said, they call it the great work. And the great work is waking people up to the other side. And he said, because when you wake up to the other side, you wake up to everything. And so... That's the word that they use on the other side when it comes to this realm that we're within here of the work that some souls are doing, which is waking people up to the other side, which is considered the great work there. And I'm not necessarily saying that in a way like Darius is here to do the all great work. It's just, it's so many people are doing it, not just me. I'm just sharing it based off of, you can access the other side through the out-of-body state very successfully if you do it properly. Some people are waking people up to the other side through their near-death experiences. So there's a broad of different people doing what is considered the great work, and they are all tuning every single soul based off, because certain people are going to align with me, and I'm going to act as a tuning fork based off where they're at. Same with everybody else. So everybody's using these, tuning everybody else, tuning their frequency just to wake something up within them. That's a great analogy. Being a, a tuning fork. I guess it speaks to everyone's got their frequency that everybody resonates at and we get drawn to certain frequencies. I don't know. I think that's what goes on when I decide who I want to interview on, on the show. Same sort of thing as some people, you just feel like, oh, I've got to have that person or that person's, yeah, that was an interesting story, but I don't feel like it, it didn't quite resonate quite right. Yeah, that, that's the thing. I know what I'm doing. Like I'm fully aware now of the... Mm what I should be doing. And that's why I said before, it's, I know that my frequency is acting as a certain tuner to individuals based off where they're at. Because if someone is, let's just say if someone is 20 steps behind me in terms of my consciousness of where I'm at now, I may not be the right person to help tune them just because it will be too much. It's too much information all at once, Yeah. but someone else based off their certain experience level, they may only be three steps behind and then it's like they tune them to step up and then it, it just, everybody moves forward. It's not necessarily that one's further along than somebody and that's the way it is forever. It's just like every, we all get to the same destination, which is waking up to all things again, See everything becoming known to all souls again, because we all have access to all information. All the records is within each individual soul. And what people tend to do is they tend to look outside of themselves when literally all of the information, even when you're out of your body, is always within you. That's the records of the beginning of everything. It's all within each soul. And we all go there because that's one of the inevitable event markers within this realm that takes place, whether if that's through an out-of-body or inevitably when you die, when you cross over, you will eventually, it's not a matter if you do, it's a matter of when you do it, you will cross over or do it through a controlled out-of-body state and access all things again and remember it. You mentioned their records before. One of my other previous guests has 
talked about accessing the Akashic Records. Is that what you're referring to there? So the records is, yeah, you could call it the Akashic Records now. I've never heard of them say it, the Akashic Records before. I've just heard the terminal. I've been shown the Halls of Amente, the cathedrals, mm -hmm. and also the Universal Records is what I've heard them say when I was out of my body on the other side. You do have your soul record, which is all of your soul's experiences. That's what people are referring to, the Akashic Records. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a big library of information. It's the Akashic Records is a part. It's not the records of things. It's a part of it. And it's the soul's records, what was what they call it, the soul's records. And then the universal records is, imagine when you're accessing the records is, the universal records is a, just imagine as an infinite white room. So it's this infinite, never ending records of all things. And there are certain halls that you could go down. One, The hall on the left will lead you to your soul records, the hall on the right will lead you to the halls of Amente, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's records based on each experience, each realm, each construct within all of creation. They all have their records because everything's recorded. It's almost like, yeah, the, the, every little detail of every, everybody's life is recorded here and is access. It could be accessed in the records of all things. So does that- Yeah, this yeah. is very similar to the way that Tom Campbell, who wrote my big theory of everything, my big toe, which is toe is theory of everything. And yeah. I think his description is very similar to yours in that there's, because he's an astrophysicist, then thinks of things in terms of computing. So every thought, everything that's occurred is stored in the computer's memory and is accessible. He calls it the, I think it's the great big computer. He's got a crazy, it's a kind of a funny name for it, but it's really Think of it like a massive storage device that has no limit to how much it can store and there's no limit to the detail, like every thought, every emotion, every event, every action that you took is accessible and the same with everyone else as, as well. It's all available and all stored there. Yeah, that's just different. Everybody's using different terminologies and it's not, I'm not necessarily saying that because people are calling the Akashic record, which is, I was told as a soul record, it's the same thing really. But yeah, that's, it's, the, all things are stored. There's nothing is lost. Yeah. And so this is why you, you, there's literally, when I say you're naked on the other side, you're truly naked and that's not necessarily mm -hmm. a bad thing, right? That's just like your, all, all aspects of yourself is seen by each soul and this vice versa. So there's no hiding either. And here you have hiding and, and therefore because of the hiding, you're afraid to be yourself or because you're afraid to be judged based off your full soul expression. But when you're over there, the naked is a very, you finally let go. You let go of all the stuff that you're carrying on to of, oh, I'm going to be judged for expressing this version of myself when it's all accepted over there because you're free to express yourself in whatever way you choose to express yourself with no limitation and no condition. And, and that scene and the uniqueness of each soul is honored. You know, that's where the unconditional love comes into play. It's more of honoring the soul you know, because it's you honor that soul's unique expression of all things because there's no other soul like that in all creation and you honor that and you honor it unconditionally because why would you want to place a condition on that which has no limitation on it yep yeah. so what's some of the most important things that you've learned in your experiences on the other side that's a a lot <laughs> it's you're talking about all right integrity would be the one in walking in your full, fullest expression of self. And I know that can be a very corny thing or new age terminology, but you have to just be yourself and not be afraid of the, not hiding parts of yourself because you're afraid of the judgment of others. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. when you're there, the, what people feel with the unconditional love is because they are no longer judged. And it's just a relief and they're able to finally be themselves. That alone is walking in accordance to the way that the true nature of reality is. And so when you could start doing that here, right, you don't end up blocking yourself up, you know, like distorting your own energy, blocking your field, creating distortions. And therefore those distortions creates illnesses within the body. A lot of people have a lot of illnesses within the body that typically has nothing to do with the sickness or the disease, but it has to do with blocking the field, their field is being blocked by holding on to things like it's as above, so below, as within, so without. This is why you could get, 
your old grandmother that lives to 105 that drank liquor every single night because she was truly happy and peace in her fullest soul expression. She was in joy. And you could have the person that is focused on all of the newest health things, cleaning themselves, and they die when they're 35 years old. So it's when you contain and restrict the flow of your energy, you're also restricting that very life force, which is your soul, which is to fuel the body that you're within. So be your authentic self. And don't be your authentic self at your own peril. And yeah. be your authentic self is the most important thing you've learned. So if people feel like they're a bit of a duck out of water, this is something I've felt my entire life, right? A bit of a duck out of water, a bit of an oddball, odd person yeah. out. Yeah. What do you say to people who often feel like that? It's something I've come to grips with because I'm, I think once I got middle age, I seem to be doing it, coping with that better. But I think for a lot of young people, that's something that they really grapple with. Have you got any advice for those people in that situation? It's just going to take the breaking the shell really, isn't it? So it goes back to what I said already. Why is someone cooped up in a shell? It's typically, it, actually it's 100% all the time because they're afraid of what others think, the judgment side of things. Yeah. 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 100% of the time. So if you could just get in a space where you just don't care, this is what it's like on the other side too. Like it's almost like you, no one cares to judge you for you being yourself. This is why I said before, this is why people have some, so much relief in NDEs. It's just, oh my God, finally, I don't have to be that person because yeah. you were pretending the whole time. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's when you could just finally let go of the pretending, you could even play a game with yourself, right? Let's just say your truest expression of self is so far out there for other people that you have to pretend that you're acting then do that. Say, oh, I'm just going to act today. And you're going to act like whatever your truest version of self. And then you play it like a game and then you start to be more fulfilled because then you could finally break that shell. And then that acting, pretending to be the version that you are always, but you're saying to other people, you're acting just, then that comes to the forefront and it becomes your everyday living experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's useful. Yeah. Did you go through that process yourself? I can imagine being a young person having the experiences that you're having there. Are probably no one else around was having those same experiences. Yeah. Did you go through that phase yourself or did you get to a point where like, this is me, this is what's happening with me and I don't care what anyone else thinks? No, I've never really cared, to be honest with you. I would share it with some people, but I never really had that up near because it's like, for instance, like I was so attuned to the other side as a child where it was like, where I said it. I really don't care what people think is because even when, for instance, when I was in school, I had a teacher saying, oh, you have to do this homework. And I knew all this was absolute bullshit. I was like, I have a question. Why do I have to do this when I don't have to do it on the other side? I don't have to do this in heaven. So why do I have to do it here? I said, this is pointless. It's not actually, well, what does this lead to when, and so yeah. I was always doing things like that. I was always aware and always attuned to that, to the other side and where typically all kids are always attuned to that. It's like they, they shut it down due to pure pressure of, oh, it's weird. And they shut it down. And this is where it goes into as a child, when you're growing up, that's the very first signs of suppressing your uniqueness and putting it in a bubble and containing it and locking it away. And you, you have some kids that just don't do that. And they're considered rebels. You know, I'm a proud rebel because I will always and forever continue to be my authentic version of self. Cause there's no other soul like that in the universe and same with every other soul. Yeah. That's a good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of other questions I wanted to ask you. So for people who might be a little bit like me, where they've dabbled with the out of body experience and astral travel, maybe had some success, maybe not, maybe frustrated with that. Where's a good place for people to start? So people to start with the, how to do the out of body. Yeah. 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 So I would, when you're starting with an out of body, there's always two types of people, right? The people that experience sleep paralysis naturally is going to be the easiest person to teach this to, because you're already entering one of the hardest parts <laughs> to get to when yeah. you have to do a control. Now I'm going to explain for that person. If you're in sleep paralysis, all right, you already know the sensations. You can't breathe, talk, move. And typically when you're there, right, th this is what I would do. I would either try to move my fingers or my toes, right, to wake myself up. And I know a lot of people could relate to that. 
but they do that because they're in the state of anxiety and panic, right? But if you don't move anything, stay with it. You'll notice if you stay with it and you just are calm and get rid of the fear of oh, I'm going to die because you're not going to die. And I'm giving you that reassurance. If you just get rid of that particular fear that you have, you will start to feel sensations within the body, ringing in the ears, buzzing throughout the entire body. And if you are calm through that process, you will start to feel a shift within your body that this is the soul starting to shift like exit. Yeah. So that could be like a tilt to the side or anything. You'll feel the soul start to come out or disconnect from the body. At that point, you don't necessarily want to just sit there and be passive, right? Because there still is a pull. There's this magnetic pull. At that point, when you feel that, you want to try to, I just roll out anymore. So I just roll out onto the floor, right? And you, at that point, you'll hear like this popping sensation. You'll hear wind, like a loud, like there, there's so many different, it's hard to explain all the tones, but you will feel and hear the disconnect, right? When you do that. And when you come out, as soon as you come out, it's going to feel, especially if you're rolling out, it's going to feel like you, your physical body just rolled out of the bed. And you're going to think, oh, I just fell on the floor. But if you stand up from that point and you look on the bed, you'll notice that your physical body's still sleeping on the bed. And you can look at your hands and you'll see that you are in your soul and it is more physical, more dense than your physical body. This is the part where people are at this point immediately. Anxiety or fear sucked right back in the body. What I recommend, if you look back at your body, just walk out the bedroom, right? Create the distance. If you walk out your body, like I said before, in the beginning of this, give it around like 30 seconds or so, come back in the room when you're calm and you can actually touch your body sleeping on the bed as well. And then at that point, you can start to explore and start to see what people are doing in real time within this realm, because that's typically what you will access in the beginning, which is just things taking place in real time within this realm. Now, for people that don't do this naturally, sleep paralysis naturally, you have to understand the sleep cycles, right? And this is something that I've started to study and implement on myself to do it at will is when you understand the sleep cycles, every, when you're going to sleep about every 90 minutes, your brain, right? It's typically 90 minutes. It's not exactly on the dot, but typically every 90 minutes, your brain enters deep sleep Delta, right? Now, if you are conscious, if you stay conscious and aware that in that process, when your brain wave is out Delta in that 90 minute cycle, if you're consciously aware, you're in sleep paralysis immediately, right? And at that point, you follow all the other steps and then you exit. Now, it's difficult to time the 90 minutes, especially because I, there's a process that I use for myself, but you have to, a very simple technique because to explain the methodology on it, it, it take way too long to do, but a very simple technique to use is when you're going to sleep every single night, sleep on your back, but stay consciously awake the entire time. Don't try to force being conscious because then you're just going to stay awake. If you're like, okay, I'm consciously awake. I'm not going to fall asleep. You're, there's too much energy there and you're still, you're not allowing the body to go to sleep. So you allow the natural cycles of your sleep to just kick in, just go to sleep, but try to stay conscious the entire time. There hit a point typically within 90 minutes. And if you miss the other, not that 90 minutes, it's could be 90 minutes to three hours, if you're staying conscious, staying calm, allowing everything to go to sleep, your body will start to shut down. You'll start to feel like someone laid a lead all over your body. The breathing will become very shallow. And when the body starts to shut down, this is where people go into panic, right? Because just when you start to hit the sleep paralysis, you literally feel like everything in your body shutting down, like it's literally dying. But if you get rid of the fear and just let it die, right? The answer sleep paralysis. And if you're calm at that point, pop out. Yeah. That's a simple thing without going into all, all the details and stuff like that. Cause like last time I held a workshop on that was just that alone, going through all the details, things, the three stages popping out. It's like a two hour workshop that I've held on that. Was there, oh, okay. I shall ask you this question. So the work that you're doing, so the great work on the other side, I've heard this described. I've recently started reading the law of one which is, was written back in the 80s. So it was a channeled text, like five different volumes of text that was channeled from a group entity from the other side. They're talking about taking humanity from this sort of third dimensional existence to a more fourth dimensional, which is really 
uh, related to what you were saying was it's really making people aware of this higher level of existence that's really all based around love and the fact that we are all one we're all connected in one way we all have our own individual identity but we're all ultimately connected and that's not just us humans but it's also every other being in the universe and the earth and the trees etc but how do you feel about the future of humanity when you think about what's going on at the moment this was three days ago because every out-of-body experience that i have i write down in my journal and i usually document it i was actually with this being and we were actually he was showing me everybody he was showing me a city we're flying over a city and he was like it's very interesting everybody's playing their scripts perfectly he said everybody can access this stuff but not everybody's ready to like it, when they're ready to then they'll realize they have access to all things so based off of that everybody is playing their role perfectly like i said before everybody's acting as a tuner to turn to tune certain people based off where they are consciously like for someone like me i will do no good and zero service to someone that is just waking up to the basics of things because i will go way beyond over their head they need a particular set of person in that a certain frequency that is more relatable to them to tune them to guide them along the process of the inevitable of waking up to all things again hmm. so when people stick into doom and gloom all the time this realm has predetermined event markers that will take place regardless this is where it also goes into you don't necessarily really have free will here the way that people think that they do you have freedom to do anything that you want and desire on the other side but because this realm has predetermined set markers within it right you're free to choose a trillion different paths but all those different paths is always going to lead to the event markers within this realm that will be experienced by each soul one of them is the most in your face is everybody will eventually access the other side whether if that's through death or controlled near-death experience that is a inevitable event that will take place within this realm now you could go off into being a businessman being a guru and yogi you could go off and just playing video games or whatever you're going to experience that regardless so there are event markers within this realm that regardless of whatever path you choose you will experience that one of them being waking up to all things again every single soul will get there whether if it's on their deathbed or actually just being tuned to that frequency again and just remembering it so i think everybody's playing their scripts as the being told me amount of body state everybody's playing their scripts perfectly everybody's doing exactly what they need to do at the right timing because everything is divinely timed yeah that's a message i've heard before it's like there's an inevitability to what's occurring but there's also no rush and if we if we completely mess it up that's also okay we will eventually find our way to yeah every, that, to every, to. every everybody is everybody will wake up and see it all like i said before now it's not necessarily waiting right uh, uh, this is an experience that takes many people to break free from but the constantly waiting waiting for some magical thing to happen you know it's like me right so if i'm telling somebody Hey, listen, through my experience and also yours as well, because you've had an out of body astral projection and you've mm. become fully conscious there. So you have that ability that you could keep on practicing, right? But some people will choose to wait for some magical thing to happen when you can access all these things now. Yeah. You mm -hmm. could work on them and you could access these things. This is where it goes into where people are waiting for fourth density frequency or fifth density frequency and in a sense isn't me leaving my body accessing someone's thoughts potential time events accessing that which people are already waiting for fourth fifth density frequency yeah you see yeah so everybody could access these things now if they have the willingness and desire to access it and it, it lines up perfectly with what the being told me everybody's playing their scripts perfectly and everybody can access all these things but they're not ready to unless they desire to access it yep, yeah that makes sense yeah all right what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they have questions darius so everything that i share the method that i teach is all on my website dariusjwright.com so you can learn everything there how to have the out-of-body state i do have a youtube channel but I, i'm not 
really active on social platforms. You want to learn from me, old school, go to the site and, or just go to YouTube and stuff like that. But yeah, you'll learn everything you need from me on my website, derisjwright.com. All right, cool. So just give us a quick summary of what you've got going on there as far as your programs and your teaching goes, because I'm interested as well in, in getting an understanding of that. Yeah. So what I, what I teach there on the site is I hold occasional workshops which is, it's more of a Q&A workshop and also teaching people in depth the out-of-body state. I do have a method there that is called Awakening Your Dormant Abilities. It's a method that is teaching people the out-of-body state, the three stages of the out-of-body experience. I go into the nature of reality there. But the whole concept of my offerings is to just get each person that wants to have an out-of-body experience, teach them the methods that I have used for myself and get them to actually access that which they have the right to access because every single soul can access all these things. And it's just, instead of waiting and waiting and trying to get information constantly from outside of yourself, this allows you to access the true universe and the nature of reality of who and what we are and do it and stop waiting for dates and things like that. Really, but that, that's pretty much what I teach. It's just workshops and I put together a method that's just up there as well. But typically a lot of people find use out of the workshops for the Q and A's and stuff like that. That must be very fulfilling work. I think it's such an exciting realization to go, well, what you think is real. And then that there's a whole nother level to reality. That must be pretty exciting to be able to help people make that leap with the work that you do. Yeah. What's, what's actually exciting for me is so when I share what has worked for me. And I'm experienced and I'm doing these things and I'm like, all right, so this is the stuff that you do. And then people that have had natural things like me, like it's almost like going back to my old version of myself. Like if someone was telling me this back in 2000, even when I was 16 years old, I would just think to myself, it's like, uh, how much time did I waste? You know what I mean? That I've could have been doing and accessing certain things. And I get emails and I've get people sharing with me, like this worked, this happened to me. And I'm like, cool, just keep on going. Trust me, you're pretty much there. Just keep on going a little bit more and you'll access even more. And that's really the most fulfilling thing to me is that people are actually becoming fully empowered. Again, truly standing in, not becoming codependent on something outside of themselves or even codependent on me, right? But it's teaching them the tools, the natural abilities that everybody has to access the other side in physical density. Awesome. You're teaching people how to fish, not just giving them the fish. That's my granddad yeah. used to say. All right. So one last positive message for anyone before we wrap it up, Darius? No, I, I think I covered it. It would more be that all of the information of that, what you're seeking is always within yourself. It's literally access to all things starts from within. When people say that we're waiting for the collective, we're waiting for people, we're not waiting for the collective. You entered this realm by yourself. And you leave this room by yourself. So all things, your experience, your knowledge, working on yourself, it all starts with self. So I think this is actually a positive message because instead of focusing on everything outside of yourself, if you were to just turn that around and focus on yourself more, tune within yourself, natural intuition, getting attuned to that again, those natural things that you just shut down over time by just ignoring, you'll find that all of these things, your natural intuition, the other side has always been calling you and knocking at the door and waiting for you to answer it. That's the perfect message, Darius. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to having another conversation with you at some point in the future. Yeah. Thanks for having me.